I'm Jim Kelly with the Eureka Fire Department, Assistant Chief Fire Marshal with the Eureka Springs. And on June 18, 1993, responded to a call to Judah Street of uh, what was reported as a fire, um, house fire possibly, and an explosion. We went. Uh, I responded in an engine as an EMT firefighter at that time, a little less than two years experience. Responded to the call to uh, in an ambulance shortly went behind me. We had a uh, one unit on duty basically, and two one crew of two men on duty. One uh, took the ambulance and I took the engine. First vivid memory that I have of that that still sticks with me it was um, driving up seeing two individuals running up to the truck. I was the first person arriving uh, and it's kind of a wooded area, a lot of trees, trying to look and watch for smoke from the truck cab. Wasn't seeing much smoke, trying to get an idea of what I might have. The first thing I really remember driving up on scene was uh, seeing two individuals come running around the corner uh, of a fence, if I remember right, coming up running up to the side of the truck. And remember seeing those two individuals definitely appeared to be, uh, had been burned. Uh, you could literally see skin hanging off of, and I don't remember who's, who it was, off their hands as they run up to me and crying for help. Started pulling off a hose and getting the truck set up to do an attack on the fire and go do it. And primary thing was to do a primary search. So additional people got there. One crew went in and took the first floor, myself and another individual, I don't even remember who, went to the upstairs to uh, check that area. And nothing upstairs. Uh, a small amount of fire, if any, was even up there. I don't even remember that. Any fire being upstairs, it was pretty much a flash flop fire and very little fire and a little bit of smoke. When I come down the stairs, the other crew had told me that uh, they had found them. There was victims in the back room uh, to that area where we found individuals uh, in different various locations on the floor uh, that it was obviously had perished in. Their clothing was still burning a little bit and smoldering, and we put a little bit amount of water on those to put those out, and that's really all we had to do from when I got down there as far as putting out the fire. Um, we then backed out of the room and uh, called a coroner, waited for the uh, them to get there, and other things. We had other units coming in and additional help, another squad coming in by that time to take care of the two people that had gotten burned and was working on flying them out and transferring them out to bigger hospitals. We were getting that info back on scene uh, and then finding out who the family were and who the people were. At that, Basically, it was kind of at that time that I really remember knowing who they were and some of which people that I grew up around this town being a small town on or in. And um, that kind of makes a bigger impact. And uh, then we were uh, continuing to try to find out uh, who the, if the other two we thought would live or not, and they were burned bad, and we had no idea if they would or not. It just didn't, they were very extensive burned injuries. So um, on a flash fire, basically it would be a fire that would be lit off by, uh, for example, in this case, fumes or vapors of uh, flammable or combustible liquid getting ignited uh, or reaching a pilot source of any type that would set, would flash and set that fire that you basically get the vapors burn and the vapors burn away and the vapors burn and flash and then the fire pretty much goes out. Anything else may catch on fire, something with a uh, more likely paper, something like that might catch on fire and a little bit of things that would be easier ignited, but uh, the other, a lot of the other things would not necessarily even burn. My name is Dave Stoppel. Uh, on June 18th, uh, 1993, I was uh, responded to a uh, call for a house fire. I'd like to kind of go back earlier in the day and kind of tell you what was going on that day. As it was, it was a pretty warm day, and we were. Uh, I was on call that day. Uh, Jimmy Kelly and Rob Connell were the two paramedics on duty. Uh, John Elam and myself were on duty or on call because we worked 24 on, 24 on call, and 24 off. Earlier in the day, we had there had been a call out on the Litkey farm for like a 12-year-old girl that had had a four-wheeler accident. They thought she had a broken femur and they were going to transfer her out. So John and I had come in for that call and uh, they said, well, we're going to have to transfer her out. So we said, okay, I'm going to run home, take a shower real quick, come right back. Don't go on that transfer before I have a chance to get out of the shower. So I ran home. 
jumped in the shower. As soon as I got in the shower, I mean about a minute into the shower, well, the tone goes off. And I'm thinking, those so-and-sos toned that out because they knew I was in the shower. Well, as the tone went on, they said, it's a house fire on Judas Street. I'm like, great. At first, when they toned it, it was just a house fire. But then as it went on, they said there were people trapped in the house. So this uh, I lived out on Forest Lane, which is out behind the elementary school. And I made it out of the shower, got dressed, got in the car, drove to the fire station, picked up Squad 2, drove it by myself because there was nobody here, over to Judas Street. took eight minutes. I get there, and the way I remember it is, is I pulled the ambulance in. There was one ambulance there. There was a fire truck in front of it. And then I pulled that ambulance into the left started down towards the fire scene and and they were walking towards me and Ray saying we got to take care of this guy. Well I look at Dwayne and he's has on a pair of jeans, has on shoes, does not have a shirt on and he's walking like this with his arms out and he's you can tell that by the color of his skin that he's badly badly burned. Now, he doesn't have any skin dripping off of him or anything. So I immediately run around to the back of the ambulance because I had seen John's little bald head in there uh, when I went by, so I yanked the door open and said, John, I need, and that's when I looked over and saw you, and you were sitting on the cot, I can remember it very vividly, uh, and you looked at me and John looked at me, and that's when I quit talking because I was, uh, didn't know what to say then because I could see you standing there and I could see skin and fingernails hanging off of both of your hands, and I remember that most vividly. That's the most, I remember that more than anything. The rest, I remember you were wearing a tank top, and a pair of shorts, and a pair of flip-flops. Wow, for being in a fire, she didn't have much protection on. He was he had the IV in his hand, and he was going down to your left arm, and he was just about ready to stick an IV in your left arm when I opened the door. You know, I'm an EMT at the time. I'm a lieutenant on the fire department. I'm an EMT working full-time, but, but I hadn't uh, considered paramedic school yet. One of the things on the scene that really bothered me was is Here's John. He's in the he's in the back of the truck taking care of you. I've already been told there's more people down there that are going to need to be taken care of, and I tried to get somebody to get one of the medics that was down there to come up there and help me. And they're like, no, no, they're in the fire, or they're they're trying to fight the fire, so they're not going to come up and help. What I said to you earlier was is that they give him 200 milligrams of Demerol, and that was the pain medicine that they gave him. And <clears throat> when we initially got there. And I remember trying to get somebody to give him more pain medication because I know with burns, it's, I mean, you can basically give everything you've got and you're not going to stop the pain. We, we had trouble getting a helicopter that day because of the weather. Got you ready and flew you out, Gina, and uh, then they weren't able to get another helicopter, so they decided that we were going to uh, take Dwayne by ground to Tulsa. A couple of things I remember about it were the trip was is, is that we went pretty fast. I remember when we went through Sonora, we were going up the hill in Sonora, and I seen the Aravac helicopter go over, and they were headed from north to south. And to the north, I could see like big black clouds, and it was very stormy looking. And we get there, I pull in, I run inside, and I said, we have the burn patient from Eureka. And they said, well, we just took her upstairs. And I said, no, 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 we have the second burn patient from Eureka. And they said, well, they're supposed to be coming by ground. And I said, I know. I drove. My understanding, they were using lacquer thinner to take carpet or the backing of carpet up off the floor. It had showered, just like a June thunder shower like it does here. All the windows and doors were open, cleaning with the lacquer thinner, everything's good. Uh, come the shower, so the doors and windows got closed. The, the theory was is that somebody turned on the hot water, and when they did, it lit the water heater. And when the water heater lit, there was enough concentration of lacquer thinner in the room that it just was a flash fire and went boom. I was told that the folks that were in there beside you never moved from where they were when it flashed. I don't know. I, I, I heard screaming that, and, I mean, because obviously everybody's in pain, but I, I don't. Uh, what I was told was is the guys that were on the floor scraping never moved. They were... Just fell to the ground? Nope was still in the position where they were scraping the floor. Wow. They never moved. It just froze them in time.
I could never get over being mad at the paramedics for running in the fire and not taking care of the people that were coming out. Their thought process is, is we've got people in there, we need to get them out because that's what they were being told. You know, we've got, apparently there had been four more people in there and they were trying to get bunked out and get in there to get them out. Because I remember the looks on their face when I said, I need a paramedic up here right now. And they're like, we gotta, we got to get in there, there's more people in there. Then going home that night and deciding I've got to become a paramedic. Because we thought they were going to be bringing more folks in. I mean, we're over there getting ready, we're moving the ambulance, we're thinking, well, they're going to be bringing more folks, and they never brought anybody, and they never brought anybody, and they never brought anybody. Because, I mean, that was something that we talked about at the fire department for months and years, and, you know, even just a few years ago when I still worked here, we would talk about that fire because it was, it was so devastating. I mean, probably has to be one of the worst loss of life fires in Eureka Springs history. Can you share with us how this accident affected you personally? Well, I mean, that was the impetus for me going to paramedic school. Otherwise, I don't know if I would have ever went. But being there and, not, and having that helpless feeling of, you know, I can't do what this guy needs me to do for him. You know, he needs an IV, he needs pain meds, he needs out of here right now. The only thing I could do is get him out of there. And that, to me, just wasn't acceptable. I needed to be able to do more than that if I was going to be in this business. The call was for a fire, but upon arrival, really didn't see anything. Maybe a little bit of smoke, didn't see anything fully involved. Uh, totally wasn't expecting what we found. Uh, Gina Patterson, who I'd met prior to the fire, uh, briefly, I didn't know her. Didn't didn't know her well. You know, she came walking around the corner. All the years before and all the years since, I've never seen anybody burn that bad that was walking around. She was shaking, visibly shaking, and was ups understandably upset. But when she raised her hands, she was trembling, and I'll never forget. She she had on red nail polish, and as I looked, I could see that the skin had sloughed off the bones in her, in her hands, her phalanges, and, and was dangling down. I'll never forget that. I looked at her, and she had on a pair of shorts, I believe, and maybe a tank top. Uh, it was summer, it was warm. Uh, we just had a, a small thunder shower, one of those afternoon thunder showers. And everywhere that there, there wasn't clothes was burned. My initial thought was yeah, that one, uh, uh, I don't think those girls are going to it. The thing about working as a, as a paramedic, a lot of people say, well, how do you how do you do that job? And it's, it's a matter of the things you have to do, you concentrate on so you don't look at what you're doing. You see so many horrific things in, in, in this type of work that if you sit there and just looked at what you were doing and blocked everything else out, it didn't get to you after a while. But when, when you're working, you, you think about all the things that you're going to have to do to stabilize that person, and it kicks in. It's like a, a, an automatic thing that turns on, like a light switch. Somehow, she got up in the back of the ambulance, and it, it, there was a, a, trying to help her, there was just no place to touch it. It wasn't burned. You think about starting an IV, and that's the big thing, the fluids and the pain medication for is what I wanted to give her more than anything because she was hurt so bad, I'll never forget that. Uh, sorry, it's just, you don't see something like that and, and it not bother you. When you start an IV, you, you, you feel for the, the little elasticity of a vein in your arm. Well, that's out because she's her entire arms are charred. Uh, even her, her neck, sometimes you can go for an external jugular vein. I've done that a bunch of times. That's out. So basically, her arms, her feet, her legs, her face, her neck, you're running out of spots here. And there, there's really not a good spot to, to start an IV. So, And I just looked and went in, stuck it in her arm, and I got an immediate flashback of blood, which lets me know that I was in the vein. And I threaded it in, and it was a 16-gauge IV catheter, which is huge. And then I pulled out the morphine. 
and before we moved, I had her snowed pretty much. Uh, I didn't want her to hurt. I had a, a volunteer firefighter helping me who would go on EMS calls, uh, and he was in even in our on our department. He was on another department, but he had to be in the area, and he stopped by to see if he could help. And I just grabbed him and I said, "Drive, get us to the hospital." When you're in a fire, you breathe in those superheated gases and, and the superheated air, you know, and especially in that flash explosion, the, the air was heated so hot that you take in a breath and all that goes into your lungs and it causes a burn inside of your lungs along your trachea. And if you are not careful, they can, their, their airway can swell shut and then you're really screwed. She started uh, having some coarse uh, wheezing, some some bronchi, just some, you know, and I could tell that her trachea was starting to, to swell. Well, she had to be intubated. If it was one of those things, if you don't get her intubated, you got a closed airway. She's not going to be able to breathe. She's going to die. So we drag out a drug called we call it sucks or succinylcholine. And it's a paralytic. Uh, without the IV, couldn't give this drug, wouldn't be able to intubate. She had to be intubated. It, it causes paralysis of your breathing. Uh, it's you're conscious, but it stops all voluntary muscle movement. In other words, your heart's still beating, but you can't raise your arms. You can't. You don't breathe. You stop everything. Had to had to bag her manually. There's not a ventilator at this hospital. There wasn't at that time, so we're sitting there manually bagging her and giving her IV solutions, pain medication, and the doctor finally gets there. You know, even though they had the windows open, that rain is coming down. It's keeping that air inside that room, and it's with the humidity, it's not able to dissipate as much as it should. Now they had every ignition source off except the hot water heater had a pilot light and when those gas the, the, the lacquer thinner fumes and the, the, the molecules settled to the floor with the humidity and the rain coming in settled to the floor and when it reached that certain point for fire to happen it has to have three things oxygen a fuel source and an ignition source so you have oxygen in the air you have a fuel which is this lacquer thinner fumes, and the ignition source is a hot water heater pilot. Went through, looked at, at the damage, doing a salvage, and uh, having to remove the bodies of people that you know uh, is not a fun thing. But after everything was said and done at the end of the day, I remember thinking, did I help or did I not? Will she hate me for what I did? Uh, I'm not sure that if the, the roles were reversed then I would want to have lived to go through what she was going to go through because I thought she was going to die anyway and I thought I should have just, you know, I, but I couldn't. I mean, there's no way, you, you just can't, but I just didn't want her to hate me because of all the pain that she was going to have. And if, you know, resent, resent me because of, why did you say me? Why did you just let me go? We could have just let my airway close and I could have died or, you know, any number of things and I just didn't want to be hated. I, I hoped I'd done the right thing. And then to hear from her kind of out of the blue, I guess, um, and knowing that she's alive and the things that she's doing now, uh, you know, God knew what he was doing. He obviously had a purpose. And, and I, I believe that she went through this for a reason, whether it was to inspire others or uh, to make other people see how lucky they are. Uh, she, uh, I, I know that she volunteers at burn camps, and to that any kid that's feeling sorry for themselves because they've burned their left arm or or got a you know, burn on her neck or something like that. To turn around and, and look and see the kind of burns that she has and how happy she is and genuinely a joy to be around. 
she grabbed life by the horns and took it for a ride. And she's not letting it stop her in any way. And that's admirable. In the room and the glass, that big, huge glass window that was on the north side also. Okay, okay. Like the deck and then that big okay, so window. so there was a big window there. There's okay. a huge window okay. and a tree right outside it. Okay. Um, I was standing facing this way and the hot water heaters over there and I remember there being a burst of warm air come through the room and then I turned to look where it was coming from. Yeah. Because I mean it was like out, you know, like it was obvious. Uh -huh. And I turned and looked and then the fire was from the ceiling to the floor all the way across the room like, but it was like in slow motion. Behind you? Yes, coming yeah, from the coming hot water heater. Left. Really? Uh-huh. And, um, and he said sometimes your adrenaline gets going so fast that things Everything seem else. like they're in slow motion. Yeah. Yeah. And so once it hit me, then it was like real time, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. But um, um, so the window's behind me, and as soon as it hit me, I was like thinking, I've got to get out of here. And so I'm like analyzing the room, can't go out that way. And so I took a big step to my left and jumped and busted through that upper half. Yes. Okay. I mean, my eyes are shut, but I remembered played sports all my life you know you yeah. gotta learn to be quick yeah. Yeah. so I just took a big step jumped and busted through it and I remember my arm being cut and my leg was cut and then um, I landed on the deck and it took me a second to you know like get my wits and I got up and then there was a gate on the side with a lever and my hands were just so burned I just couldn't I couldn't get it to couldn't even get off the deck the lap. Yeah. well I did because uh -huh. she had it has like three steps down three or four uh -huh. and then I walked back up there's like a little five foot incline mm -hmm. and then I walked up and took off my shoes at the front door and I was fixing to try to go back inside and Dwayne came around he's like there's people inside there's people inside and I was like I know I know uh -huh. we need to go across the street and then that's when we went to the McGuire's off. so we went inside and um, she was like, do you want to sit down? I was like, no, I don't want to run your furniture. I mean, I'm like thinking wow. weird. Yeah. And um, I tried to sit down on the carpet, but when you're that burned, you yeah. lose the elasticity. Oh, I so I was like, even oh, been, huh? no. Yeah. And so I sat on the edge of a chair. I was like, well, I'll sit on the edge. And then I put elbow on each knee and I was like, you know, just like, what just happened? You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Like it yeah. just, what happened? And I saw my hands and skin and charcoal and um, then I heard the, the sirens. I think it's one of those you don't have that many in the, in the run of your uh, career. I've been doing 20 something years uh, and you don't have that many and then that are people you know as well too, you know, to have that happen all at one time and stuff too. So it's, you, you kind of remember some, some things for a while and it stays with you yeah. a little bit and sometimes you'd be doing nothing and all of a sudden a memory of that and it just goes away. It's like, where'd that come from? What was I thinking to even bring that up? Why did, where'd that come from? Yeah. It's not like negative flashbacks. I mean, yeah. it was horrible, and I missed my dad and sister, mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. thought highly of the Birchville boys, mm -hmm. Bill and Terry, mm -hmm. and they were nice and, and stuff like that, but I look at it like I'll see them again someday. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. And yeah. I wouldn't wish this on anyone, yeah. having right. to go through oh, no, all the, the surgeries. And so and I just look at it like they're in a better place. Yeah. Um, they're missed, but sure. you know that kind of thing. But I mean, yeah. I do remember those details. Yeah. And so, and plus going and talking to the, like the high schools and fire prevention. Yeah. And, you know, I kind of not well, really. Positive but spin on top of it has been, and you know, it really helps to kind of know you and see, and hear and talk to you, because then when you think of that, you think, the positive end of it too. So that you know, I really didn't know for a long time that you had made it and survived or anything about him. It's hard to get information later to find out, did they survive, did they make it? And you get rumors, but no confirmation. Right. So it's, it's kind of good to hear, know what you're doing and what you have done with your life too after that too. It puts a real positive end to that thing.